Morning. Um, yeah, I originally entitled the talk Software Packaging with RPM Demystified uh, back in January. I, present, I sent in the um, proposal. But uh, the more I get into it, the more I realize that I'm still mystified. Um, I'm going to cover package building, not package management, because um, package management is essential, essentially simple, yum, um, even Puppet Chef can install your packages for you. Uh, but there is a lot of detail around package building. Um, I'm a software engineer with semantic.cloud working on the uh, message labs email infrastructure. Um, and I'm also an author uh, working on the RPM handbook. Uh, I looked at RPM from two perspectives. One is I don't understand it. Um, we have a large infrastructure at Message Labs, um, something like 10,000 mail servers, um, and everything has to be packaged as RPMs for deployment. Um, and using enterprise operating systems, um, we have different versions. Some of them are quite old. Um, and, it's, and what you need to know is not well documented in RPM. So I must apologize that the talk is not exhaustive, although it might be exhausting. So I'm going to talk about what RPM is, then move on to building the RPMs, different aspects of it, and then just a few pointers to sources of further information. The significance of packaging. Back in 2007, Ian Bur Murdoch on his blog said that package management is the biggest advancement that Linux has brought to the industry. Um, prior to uh, RPM and Debian packaging, most packages would be installed from tarballs. Um, you might have to edit the make file. There was almost certainly no guarantee that you could remove what you'd installed, even if the, what you'd installed had, had destroyed your system. Um, Debian and RPM packages evolved around about the same time. Um, 93, 95 was when they sort of first emerged, and they are comparable, roughly, in functionality. RPM provides a straightforward and consistent way to manage your software. Um, Puppet, Chef, CMSs like that will deploy software it, um, either in RPMs or, or Debians, or use YUM, quite simple to install your software. It's a fundamental building block, block of your distribution, and as well as you being used within the distributions, independent software vendors, uh, crossover, Office, Oracle, whatever, they'll be packaged as RPMs, um, and the other large use cases is for internal use within data centers. And a well-constructed con package will give professional impression of your software. And the converse is that if it's not well-constructed, then people might not even bother giving your software a second chance. RPM came with a sort of philosoph philosophical view of how software sh should be packaged aimed both at end users and package builders. So from the end user perspective, it makes it easy to upgrade, powerful to query what you've got installed um, and verify what you've got installed. From the developer perspective, they took the approach that you start with pristine sources and patch that um, and by defining your dependencies, you should be able to, to reproduce your builds. And the issues, um, it is poorly documented. The man pages don't give all the options. There isn't a spec man page. There isn't an RPM macros man page. It's old. It's almost, well, it's about 20 years old now. Um, but it is still evolving. I was at the Red Hat DevConf in Czech Republic a couple of months ago, and there was discussion there about new features, which 
may go into Fedora 19, 20, 21. Uh, <laughs> the enterprise distributions lag behind these developments, and the features are probably not going to be there for quite a few years to come. Um, many of the there's a lot of detail, and some of the detail is distribution specific, although the developers are working on bringing things together to a certain extent. And then there's, there is information and there's misinformation out on the uh, internet. Uh, there are thousands of uh, how-tos on how to build packages and some of them are wrong. So just a perspective of what versions of RPM there are out there. Um, we, we use um, RHEL 5 quite a lot. That's uh, using the RPM from two th well, 2008, and RHEL 5 is, is still going to be around in 2020. Um, up till about 2005, RPM development languished. Um, the guy, the maintainer, um, left Red Hat and took development with him. Uh, nothing much happened. Zusa, Red Hat stayed on really old versions, and then they came together and relaunched the RPM.org website. Um, and then since then, there's been a, a certain amount of development of, of um, features. So RPM, what is it? It's, it is obviously a, a number of different things. It's, it's the package file format, it's the installation system, it's the database, it's configuration files, um, a set of runtime t tools, and also libraries which are used by the tools themselves and also by the packaging tools, I suspect by, by um, CMSs as well. Uh, it installs, raises, updates. Um, it checks dependencies within, within a set of packages, but actually it's the upper-level packaging tools, YUM and Package Kit, that will do the dependency resolution. So YUM, uh, RPM on its own, will you give it a set of packages and it, it will check whether the dependencies declared within that set and installed on the system are consistent and um, throw up its hands if they're not, whereas YUM We'll go and fetch stuff to solve the, the, um, the problem. And it comes with a tool which generally nowadays is a separate package, um, the build tool, RPM build. Um, so I'll look at building packages. Two main, two concepts which are quite important are dependencies and macros. Uh, we'll go on to uh, the details of the build process. Dependencies are fundamental. Um, it ensures that when you ask to install something, if, if the dependencies are properly specified, that you get all the prerequisites installed as well. And that if you try and remove something which your software depends on, it will warn you against that. And as I say, that is dependency checking, not dependency solving. Dependencies, um, they are essentially, they're expressed as capabilities, which are just text strings. There's no real semantic meaning to them. They're just checked by the RPM engine. Uh, RPM build will automatically take the name of the package and include that as a capability. Um, other capabilities uh, are sometimes known as, as virtual packages. Um, so, for example, uh, SendMail, XIM will provide the capability of MTA. Um, there are other capabilities which have a little bit more meaning, like um, RPM feature, which uh, RPM lib features like compression that's mode that's required and stuff like that, and um, the various interpreters. Perl, Python, etc., expre express what they provide as modules. Um, you'll often have a module distribution which contains a number of modules. Um, each of those modules will be 
expressed as a, as a separate capability and you should re require the capability rather than the package itself in case because pack um, different packages can provide the same capability. Um, for the packages, um, they're versioned, obviously, and this, the scheme is epoch version release. Um, those are, if you specify that you need certain minimum or maximum uh, versions of um, a package, then there are rules for comparing versions. Um, basically, epoch, a single integer, will trump any lower epoch version. But within version and release, um, things aren't so simple, uh, or rather, RPM takes a quite a simple-minded approach to comparing version strings. Um, it doesn't understand all the myriad of versioning schemes that are in, in the wild. So it says, right, I just split on non-alphanumerical, um, uh, split into, into strings of uh, numbers and alpha strings, and then compare that sequence element by element. Uh, numbers have leading digits removed, so you get things like 1.0010 is greater than 1.9 because 10 is greater than 9. 1a, one, one lowercase a, is greater than 1b because a is ascii -betically, uh, greater than... Uh, the lowercase comes after uppercase in the ASCII table. Um, epochs, as I say, uh, version 1.0 Zero with an epoch of three will trump version 99.999 with an earlier epoch. And then the separators don't actually matter. Um, so dots can be replaced with underscores. It, RPM doesn't care. And then a three ABC is the same as a three dot ABC or a three underscore ABC. Macros are again, fundamental to the operation of RP, both RPM and RPM build. All the RPM tools initialize themselves from macros. Um, for example, percent underscore top do says where your, your build area is, and things like binary payload says whether it's going to be compressed with um, XZ or uh, GZIP compression. Um, so... Uh, there are, these are defined in user lib rpm macros and a number of other files, etc. rpm and macros.star. And the macros uh, file itself defines 250 macros, and there are another 80 or so commented out. Uh, it's quite well documented, or commented rather, so it's, it's well worth having a look at that. Uh, those figures are from RPM 4.10, uh, Fedora 18. I've actually got, I think, about six source trees open, dating back from 4.42 to 4.11. And you can see sort of things coming in, coming out. That looks like a good idea. No, it wasn't. Let's rip it out. So the RPM macros come from various sources, uh, macro files that I've just said. You can define them on the, on the command line. Um, in those two places, uh, you don't specify the... I'm sorry. You, in RPM macros, you specify percent macro name and then the definition. Minus D, you specify the name and the definition. But uh, in spec files or within nested macros, you, s you use percent global or percent define. And previously, or a while back, everyone just used percent define. You shouldn't. Re you should use if you want something in the global scope. You should use percent global. There was actually a bug in garbage collection. So when a nested macro would uh, the scope ended, it didn't clear up the, the symbol table, and your locally defined macros 
spilled out into global context. Uh, that can bite, I'm not quite sure what version of um, R RPM that changed in when they fixed the bug, broke several spec files. And also RPM internally, uh, when you specify name or release or version in your spec file, it will create a, um, a macro. And there are, I think I've identified about 30 or 40 internal macros. Again, they're not, they're not documented. Um, some of them are mentioned on, on various uh, pages, especially the Fedora um, packaging guidelines. But I think even the, the maintainers are sometimes surprised at what's, what they'd forgotten. Um, macros can either be uh, simple macros or parameterized. If they're simple, then they get evaluated immediately. The, def the expansion gets evaluated immediately, whereas a um, parameterized macro will partly expand the macro as it reads it, but then also expand it when it evaluates it as well. Uh. Yeah, um, to use a macro in spec file or within uh, a nested macro definition, just percent name or enclose the name in, in parentheses. If it doesn't, if the macro isn't defined, you'll get percent name in your output, which is not how other macro languages work. But if you want, if you don't want um, the, the macro name to appear if it's not defined, then you use conditionals. Percent comma name uh, will expand if it's if the uh, macro is defined. Exclamation mark name if it's not defined. You've got conditionals, shell escapes, messages. Um, error will stop execution, the output message, and then stop. The, uh, the build, and sent dump will just give you pages of the current state of um, macro symbol table. Yeah, building RPMs sh normally from sources and patches, although, of course, you get some uh, packages which are just a spec file. They contain enough within that. Um, some people do nasty things like um, install from, create a package from the file system. Uh, that's not really how it was intended to be used, and it certainly isn't going to uh, make for a reproducible build. Um, the GNU coding standard is actually quite a good, has, has a good chapter in it on things like auto tools, which is the GNU way of, of building software, and it's the, the way that R, RPM build gives you the, 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 the macros to let you follow that uh, build process. <clears throat> yeah, you know, spec file. Um, it can be in a tar file. It'll, it'll locate a spec file within that, and the spec file can define multiple packages. Spec file should also specify what's needed to build the software. And there is a, a yum util to um, actually parse the spec file if the build requires and, and do a yum install of those of what's needed. That's used in mock. Um, as the, the build process, again, it's, it's, it seems to be obvious. But if you look at it, it's actually fairly complex. Uh, it goes through a phase of initializing itself from the macro files. Um, it reads the spec file, expanding the macros as it uh, encounters them. But the spec file is not, it's not defined by any grammar or anything like that. There's actually uh, a parser for each section of the, um, of the spec file. So it will say, oh, I've found a, um, an install section. Let's go and invoke the the parser for that section. Um, so the documentation is the source code, but the source code is fairly hairy. 
it goes through the stages of the, the build scripts defined in the, in the spec file to install uh, to a, a build root, a proxy for the, for the root file system, and then runs scripts that by default are defined by macros in, in, the, in the macro file to find the dependencies and the capabilities. It looks for shared libraries, um, user bin, executables, um, that sort of thing as, as dependencies. Um, and then it will construct binary and or source RPM depending on what uh, options you give it. And as I say, don't build, well, don't build as root. It's going to be executing shell scripts. Uh, if you build as root, you get what you, you're asking for. Um, <clears throat> and just because you can build it on your system doesn't mean that it will build cleanly or that it will install cleanly. Um, mock is very useful for testing the dependencies. Um, it's the basis of open build system and Koji. Uh, but it's actually quite straightforward to, to, um, to use standalone. Build environment, as I say, is it's defined by a set of, of macros. You probably um, know that you can put percent top dir in, um, in your RPM, .rpm macros uh, config file, but you can define it on the command line and just sort of build in the source directory, create the, the set of directories and just sort of say, build my RPM here. There is a tool from the RPM dev tools package which will set up those directories, but it will only do it in your home directory. So spec files, <clears throat> complete specification of the package, uh, metadata, dependencies, um, scripts to describe the build process, manifest of what's going to be installed, and what I'd call administration scripts for install, arrays, verify. And one of the aspects of, of, of its age is that the syntax wasn't really thought through properly. Percent can be anything. Uh, it's a macro, is it a spec, file section, and file attribute, uh, because each of the section parsers is independent of each other. You get things like percent doc is only recognized in the, in the um, file section because it's the file section parser that will implements the recognition of that. Another point to um, bear in mind is that you can have comments in your uh, spec file, but if you put macros, you sort of say, I'm using this macro percent whatever, uh, RPM build is going to expand that. And if it expands to a multi-line uh, expansion, then it's probably going to break your, your spec file or possibly do something that you hadn't intended. Set of sections. Um, the description section is often described as, as, a, as a tag, but it is actually, if you look at the parser, and it, it fits in with the other sections, and it is parsed at, by a separate parser. Um, so I'd describe it as a section rather than a tag. Um, and the build scripts all run with the born shell. Um, and um, there is one set of build scripts. There's one change log. The rest uh, can be you can have separate sections for each of the sub-packages. So the process is um, fetch the spec file from specs, then the individual uh, prep will take from things from sources into build. Build will just build in that directory. Install installs into um, build root, which is your proxy for the um, file system root. And then the files, processing the files section will generate the, um, the RPMs. 
you probably know what a, a spec file looks like, don't really need to say much about it. Um, one of the things that people seem not to understand is what the uh, Desta equals RPM build root is. Um, most, well, autoconf generated make files, um, pretty complex beasts, and they've got Desta uh, support throughout the, the make file. Uh, essentially, anything that you install, it's going to put Desta in, in front of um, your target directory. So you have prefix to say where in the file system you want your software to be installed, whether it's going to be user local or user. Um, but when you're doing the, the build, you don't want to install into the file into the root file system. So Desta is your proxy for that. Yeah, um, not much to say. Um, there is the preamble is everything that comes before the first section, or sub-packages have their own preamble identified with percent package. Set of um, keyword values. Um, each of them will generally generate a, a macro of the same name. So name is percent name, version is percent version, etc. cetera. Um, source and patch are slightly different in that they can occur multiple times. And that's done with a bit of hackery in the, in the parser. And actually, the percent setup uh, and percent patch macros aren't real macros. There are a bit of C code that pretends to be a macro and does things that you can't do in the macro language. <clears throat> Um, dependencies, by default, you probably don't need to, to, to worry too much about dependencies because RPM build does quite a good job of finding your dependencies. Um, but you can provide them with provides, requires. Prereqs tag is deprecated in 4.6, I think it is, which is after rel 5 and before rel 6. Uh, so that's one of the things you find is that there are subtle changes um, in what's accepted and what you take something, for a spec file or a, a source RPM from uh, rel 6 and try and build it on rel 5 and it just breaks um, unless people have been a bit careful about it. Zusa has got some soft dependencies. I think it suggests and recommends um, there's talk at the moment about extending that and putting it into uh, in, into uh, RPM 4.12, I think it is going to be. Um, so it's going to be suggest, recommends, augments, and I can't remember what the fourth one was. But basically, you've got the the dependency information can be provided by the main package and say by a plugin. So uh, GIMP could suggest some common plugins. But other plugins that the GIMP <coughs> project don't know about can say, we augment uh, GIMP. Uh, essentially, it's sort of tramp data that goes into the um, RPM file header for use by the package manager. Um, as I say, RPM build or RPM itself doesn't actually uh, do any dependency solving, only the dependency checking, so it's not really interested in that. Um, yeah, the uh, dependency generators are, are run immediately after the percent install section, um, but you also need to specify your build dependencies. I've just been putting together for work a, um, a build system for CPAN modules. Um, so we use about 500 CPAN modules and um, trying to maintain them when we upgrade uh, the Perl version, etc. Is We need, just need to have control over it. And specifying the build dependencies and using mock uh, 
proves to be quite a robust way of making sure that things work. And then also using mock to do the install. So you're checking twice the build and the, the runtime. Um, each of the, the build scripts executed by shell, they're, they're dumped into temporary files in var tmp. Um, prep section will use these two pseudo macros that I think if you, you, you specify rpm minus uppercase e for expand macro, you'll find that they don't exist, but um, they do in that context. So possibly calling them a macro is um, slightly misleading. Um, the build process, um, there's, uh, there are a load of macros in the, R, in the macros file to help percent configure does, does the right thing for most things. There's, there are variants on, on that. There's also a variant on make, I believe. Um, but most software w that is well written will um, build like that. Uh, install, I've talked about Desta. <clears throat> when things go wrong, it it's, can be tricky, um, especially if, if your build has taken a couple of hours to go, get to the stage of install and but something's broken. Um, you can either execute to a certain stage with the uh, minus BP, BC, BI, but there's, there's, a, there's also the short circuit option to go straight to that stage. And there is a, a short RPM program that, in Fedora that um, we only discovered at work last week, um, which will fiddle around and pretend that you've got to, say, the install stage without having gone through your build. And the, other, the other way of debugging things is just put exit one or uh, some, some sort of macro that will cause the thing to, to, to dump at that at a particular stage. I tend to just tar up the build area and um, grab the, the build script make copies of that and then just sort of manually go through. Management scripts. Um, each stage has got a before and after uh, script. Generally, there'll be uh, shell scripts, but you can specify your own interpreter. Uh, you've got before and after installation, uninstallation, but also before and after the transaction as a whole. Um, Yeah, and on upgrade, you'll get, you've got two versions of the package installed at a particular time. It installs the old version, then uninstalls the, uh, installs the new version, uninstalls the old version. So it'll run install scripts from the new package and then uninstall scripts from the old package. And to distinguish, you've got the $1 argument, which will say how many instances of this package are going to be left when, when the operation has finished. So you can detect on install, if it's one, then this is the first time the software has been installed, set up new users, etc. If it's zero on uninstall, you're the last one out, uh, switch off the lights. Um, and the sort of things that you'll want to do is set up the resources, the users groups, services, cron jobs, um, alternative system, that sort of thing. And the scripts can be for the main package or they can be for individual sub packages. Uh, just put the name after the script tag or uh, you know, if it's a proper sub package, so main package name hyphen something, then that's all you need. If it's a separate package name, you specify minus n. Specify the interpreter with minus p. Uh, b default is the, is the born shell, on, which may be bash on Fedora, but you can't guarantee that it's going to be bash. There is there's also, from quite a long time ago, 
before 442, there's a built-in Lua interpreter, which, I mean, if you're doing um, Kickstart uh, and you haven't even got the shell installed, and if you want a, a pre-trans script at that stage, Lua is all that you can depend on. Um, SH isn't there at that stage. Um, you can also, you can, you don't have to provide a script for the for the script tag. Invoking the program itself might just be enough, like LD config, uh, to update library, uh, LD, LD the, the shared Aubrey, shared object stuff. Specifying a program will create an automatic dependency on, on that interpreter. Um, or you might want to say that you require it just for that stage with a requires brackets percent uh, requires brackets pre or something like that, which says I require it on inst on uh, installation, but it's not necessarily required afterwards. So the the package manager is quite free to install for installation and then just remove it afterwards. So if you say requires pre uh, whatever, uh, then and you need it at runtime as well. You need to include a requires as well. Triggers are fun. Um, I think I missed one out. I think there's a trigger pre in as well. So again, similar to the um, the install uninstall scripts, but this is run this script when some other. Uh, Package, the target package is, is going to be installed or uninstalled. Um, I think one of the FTP servers uses that quite extensively to configure what commands are available. So it, it depends on the version of glibc, I think it is, and, and sets up whether commands are enabled or disabled. And you've got two arguments, number of instances of both source and target package. Files lists, you can actually uh, can either list them in the spec file or you can do things like build the, the files list in the, uh, the build section and then in, uh, uh, refer to that with minus F. Um, or you can have, that could be one of the um, files in your sources directory. Um, the attributes seem to be changing. There's a new percent license to mark license files, although I don't think any distro has, has yet um, uses 4.11. I think um, Fedora 19 is going to be the first one to use uh, 4.11. Um, and then you can do things like, say, uh, well, by default, uh, RPM build will say, if you've got unpackaged files in the build root, then that's an error. Uh, but again, that can be, that's one of the 80-odd macros in macros file, which you can set that to a, a false value and it um, doesn't matter. Or if you've, got, if you've got special requirements, you might have that in your... Um, RPM build command line to find it or undefine it on the define it on the command line. Uh, one of the things that we used to find is that um, someone would build an RPM, they'd leave, somebody else would try and build it, and they couldn't build it. There's sort of silent dependencies on what was installed on the original de developer's machine. Build requires. Um, ensures that or using build requires in conjunction with mock ensures that you don't fall into that trap and it's quite simple to do just set up uh, a cheroot with mock or use one of the something like Zusa open build system or Koji if you're packaging for Fedora and of course you'd also test the installation of packages that you've built um, on a different machine, on a clean machine. And yeah, RPM is evolving. Um, and if you remember that RHEL 5 is still using the original version of RPM after the, the re-founding of the RPM.org website, um, 
RHEL 5 doesn't know about any of these things, like build route is now silently ignored, group tag is no longer mandatory, Fedora has stopped putting group tags into their spec files. So one of the first things we have to do, taking a uh, source package from, from Fedora and trying to build it on RHEL 5 is you know, pepper it with group tags and stuff like that. Um, prior to 4.6, the, the, the default build area was user source Red Hat. And back at 20 years ago, people didn't really worry about building as root um, or changing the ownership of Red Hat, of user source Red Hat, or Zuzer if you're on a Zuzer machine. Um, 4.7 introduced GZ compression, RHEL 6 used that, and, which meant you can't take a can't even take a source package from RHEL 6 and install it on, on um, RHEL 5. And then you, know, you, you got 4.6 group tags no longer mandatory, and they sort of, okay, let's... There are three tags that are mandatory in, in sub-packages. I think it's name, summary, and group. And then 4.7, then it inherits group from, from the main package, um, introducing new macros. And this is just a fraction of what's in, in, the, um, in the release notes. Of the, that's where I've got the information from, the release notes and trawling through the source code. Um, so if, you, if you're interested, then look on rpm.org. They, they, you can find all the information there. Um, so another thing that's going to, to bite is that um, at RHEL 6, Pre-rec is deprecated. I think later it's, it's going to go away, and you know, our old spec files are going to break. Sorry? Yeah. 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 I think for very briefly they did internally translate them to requires um, pre, but. Yeah, I think they've got, it's the sort of thing that gets put into a develop, development release and then backed out. And there's more that I don't really have time to, to cover. Um, they, there was an implementation of SE Linux policies. It was then rolled out because it wasn't good enough and there's a new one coming along. Um, software collections is quite neat. Um, that takes something like Perl, Python, Postgres, and build it separately from the, um, the system-delivered uh, version of the package. So for Perl, uh, you've got, you could build, say, Perl 5.16. Uh, RHEL is still delivering 5.8, and it will install into opt rh, and then whatever the collection name root user and then the complete user hierarchy. So your man pages go in there, everything goes into that and then you have a, a command to enable a collection and it'll sort of say, okay, I'll go off and, and pick up that installation and it doesn't conflict, it doesn't overwrite the system installation of that package. It's something that um, Red Hat came up with for their uh, developer tools product, which they wanted to have on different versions of, of, of RHEL. Um, sur first surfaced about this time last year, but it seems it works really well. Um, we're actually using it to migrate from the operating system uh, supplied Perl to our, a software collection and then on to a, a higher version. But by moving from 5.8.8 provided by the operating system to a collection, we can then either do the, do the upgrade of Perl or the upgrade of the operating system independently. Um, it's quite nice. Um, so, yeah, there's, there is a fair amount of information out there. there is, one of the best places is probably the Fedora Project Wiki with um, information for package maintainers. OpenSUSE has got similar portal. Um, the stuff on rpm.org is, is a bit disorganized um, 
and you really need to know if you if you're if you're packaging software as opposed to other resources, then classic shell scripting and auto tools and look at the GNU coding standards. And then I've just registered rpmhandbook.com. I'm working on a, um, as well as the book, I'm working on a quick reference card and stuff like that, which I'll put up there in the, in the next few months. And thank you. If you've got any questions. That's only a fraction of the detail I found. <laughs> Um, one question you mentioned in the first uh, slide, I guess, uh, version compare for Epoch versions. Yeah. Um, is this specific to a specific RPM version? Or? No, that's. I think it, there was something called Serials, mm -hmm. um, which is mentioned in the Maximum RPM book. But that is, I think, RPM 3, or very, ocean, very early versions of RPM 4. So from about 2005 onwards, epochs were already there. Okay, I was just wondering, because um, if I run RPM version compare on my machine, it shows a bit different output. So 1A is smaller than 1B, for example. It depends on whether you, on the capitalization and mm -hmm. uh, can I just do. entered yeah. the same <coughs> values there, so I was a bit confused. Stop. <laughs> well, that also might be uh, might depend on which uh, language you lose uh, you use and which which um, environment you use for for sorting. I, I, found, I, I found that if, if you use RPM ver comp version compare or RPM ver CMP, that might look at uh, tr try it with lang equals z, and that should work. <coughs> like explained, and if you use your own language, uh, you might get different sorting there. It it's should really use the uh, C locale. Uh, certainly, um, build scripts are run in the, with C locale defined. In the Debian world, we have uh, Linkian for uh, quality checks. Is there something like Linkian? There's RPM Lint, which RPM. will give you uh, issues in the spec file or in, in okay. source RPMs. Thanks. Yeah, there's a whole bunch of um, tools like um, FPM, which is the thing package manager, which will generate Debian packages or uh, RPMs, uh, it'll create a spec file for you. Um, I'll put a, a resources section on my on my website when I get around to it. Um, Alien is from the the Debian world, which will do conversions between packages. Are there any helpers available for building Ruby gems or um, I don't know CBAM packages? Uh, look at the Ruby packaging guidelines on Fedora or OpenSUSE. <laughs> Um, I can answer that especially for SUSE, yes, for Ruby games, for CPAN spec files, for Python, there are uh, helpers that can just simply, if you download the tarball or the game, go over it and create a package for you. Um, but I also have a question, do you know the open build service? Yes. Yes. Because you mentioned so often that you should uh, try to build a package um, more or less independent so you can re rebuild it again and again without any problems. And this is exactly what the build service is. Sure. For. Yeah. I did mention open build system. Um, in, in a commercial world, you might not want to release your or let, let your source code outside your um, perimeter. And, and for in a fairly controlled environment, then uh, using mock gives you probably 90% of the... Uh, no one? No one? Ah, okay. Well, maybe because you mentioned it, 
again, word of warning, pre-requires and requires pre. That's, if, you, if you're used to using pre-requires, that, has beca that, that be then became hard dependency. So if you pre-required something in your old RPMs, it had to be on the system. You could not remove it without removing the package requiring it. If you're using requires pre at the moment, it just is there for the moment when the pre-install script is running, and after that you can remove that. So just, if yeah. you have pre-requires somewhere in your, in your spec files, just remove that. The, the resolver is smart enough at the moment to look where it is required, where it has to come in, this package, and just leave it at that. That should normally work. But don't, don't, don't think that requires pre just the same as pre-requires. Yeah, there's also a um, order with requires tag, which has come in relatively recently. And I haven't quite worked out myself what, it, what exactly it does. It's on my list of things to do. Yeah, the, um, the book and probably the, the quick reference card as well, I want to try and identify what, what changes there are so that you can um, say, I'm running this version of Red Hat or Zusa and this isn't a applicable to me or, oh, that's what they mean when in that spec file that I'm importing. Okay, thank you very much.